Let's take our Bibles, turn to the book of John, chapter 5. There's a couple of things I wanted to, I've wanted to finish in dealing with um, the issue of the Sabbath. Um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a big typology person. I love seeing types and shadows and the way things are the way that things are going to happen are the way that things have already happened god does everything for a purpose and a reason and he has revealed his secret unto his servants the prophets everything that god is going to do is revealed for us in this book either directly as a prophecy or as a doctrine or as a a what we call a prophetic picture um, in in literature if you're writing a novel or something like that you will include foreshadowing in it and I remember first learning about that uh, with a short story I can't remember what um, I was in high school I know that but it was a literature course I took on American literature American short stories and there was a story um, called the occurrence an occurrence at, at the Owl Creek Bridge. I remember that's the name of the story. And I don't remember the story at all, but I remember that it was, it was my first introduction into foreshadowing. There was something that the author had put at the beginning of that story that revealed to you the end. And if you, if you ever watch a movie and like it and watch it again, a lot of a lot of movie directors and screenwriters will include a lot of foreshadowing in their movies. They will, they will sort of give you little chunks of details about how the movie's going to end. Once you see the entire movie and you go back and watch it again, you catch those things toward the beginning. Um, a silly, I, I, I got a silly one in mind, but it's Star Trek II, The Search for Spock where uh, they have a little training session and the Enterprise training room blows up and everybody dies. So the next time Kirk sees Spock, he says, aren't you dead? And Spock does this, you know. Well, at the end, Spock dies. I hope I didn't just blow that movie for you, but anyway. I'm pretty sure you should have seen it by now. But anyway, at the, at the end of the movie, Spock dies. And it's just, you see little things like that. It, well, that's what the Bible is. This is in Ecclesiastes. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. Paul told us several times, uh, uh, these things have been written for us, for our learning and for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. So these things are written to us as prophetic stories to tell us what is going to happen, how it's going to happen, and the timing of its happening. Timelines are important. The, 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 well, let me get into it. John chapter 5, verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him uh, that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And again, that was a made-up law. God never said nothing about it being illegal to carry your bed on the Sabbath day. He said nothing about it. They added that to it and so he um, he answered them and he, he that made me whole the same said unto me take up thy bed and walk then asked they him what man is he that which said unto thee take up thy bed and walk and he, he, he that was healed wist not who it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him behold thou art made whole sin no more lest a worse thing come unto thee the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. What were they going to do? Kill him on the Sabbath day? They'd break the law. Can't kill, that's work. You can't kill somebody on the Sabbath day. They were, they were bent on getting rid of him no matter what. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless your word tonight as we seek out your grace and your mercy and your blessing. Uh, show us things, Father, that we have never known before. Uh, enlighten our minds and our eyes on things that we have forgotten. 
But show us, Father, your plan and your will for the ages. Bless your word tonight. Bless these people. Uh, be with Sister Bonnie. Be with Sister Rose tonight. Lord, who is recovering well, we ask God, the Lord, that you would continue to bless her and uh, bring her back here. Bless all those, Father, who will be traveling in the next few days. Lord, give them grace and traveling mercies. Look, Father, we look forward to a good weekend with you and with your people this weekend. Pray your blessings now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Um, so let's, we looked at the Sabbath day. We found out there's nothing in the law that uh, for, for bad or forebode the man from carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. But back very quickly in Genesis chapter 2, here's the gist of it. Here's what the Sabbath is all about. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. I want you to think about it. There is, there is an end coming. There is an end coming. God is going to end this world. Now, since he has already swore that he is not going to finish or end the world with water again, he's already sworn that, made a covenant with mankind. That's the rainbow. Since he's already promised that, he's not, he's not going to end the world with water. He's going to go completely the other direction. He's going to end it with what? Fire. I don't know which is worse. But that's how, and we'll, re, we'll read that in a little bit. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day. And I want you to get the foreshadowing here. Every man, every woman and child in this room and listening to me right now, God is working His work in your life. But at some point, God is going to end His work in your life. He's going to rest. He's going to cease from working in your life. And His work will be done. What's the last thing that Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. He didn't say... I did most of it. That's what I always said when my mom asked me, did you get your homework done? I did most of it. You know, that never counted. And it's the same thing when a Catholic priest tells you that Christ died for most of your sins, but you must pay for the rest of them. That is, that is a wicked doctrine. And it's not biblical. It's, it was made up by men. One of these days, God ends the work. He finishes it. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. There is nothing left to do for our salvation. You're either going to believe that you're, you have a religion of do or a religion called done. Our religion is called done. It's done. It's finished. Amen. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed then. When that, when that rest comes, that's the blessing. And he sanctified it. When the work is done, God gives us complete and total sanctification. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now... Uh, let's see here. I think I did this. I don't, I'm not sure. Turn to Mark chapter 2. We'll look at it very quickly and then we're going to go to Hebrews 4. Mark chapter 2 and Hebrews 4, very quickly. I don't remember because we were in, um, Harrison last Wednesday night, or last, yeah, last Wednesday night. Had, uh, had some good meetings there. Uh, I was nervous, shaking like a leaf. Figured they'd throw me out and never have me back. And boy, was I surprised. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 23. It came to pass when he went through the cornfields. And understand a little bit about corn in the days of Christ. The corn that Christ and the people had in the land of of, of Palestine, Canaan land, the Middle East, 
was not like the corn that's in Kansas now or wherever, Nebraska or wherever. That corn that we grow here in America is a South American product. They say the, the way to produce it was given to them by Viracocha. I don't know about that. I just know that corn, especially the corn that was grown here at this time, was not these big shucks of corn or the big uh, ears of corn that we have. They were smaller. The word corn simply means kernel. Any type of, whether it could be wheat corns or barley corns, barley kernels or whatever. But they had the ability to, to just take them in their hand and rub rub it like this and it would get all the chaff and everything off and they would literally just eat it raw on the on the fly just picking and eating as they went okay and that was that was that was them carbohydrates which turned very easily into sugar uh, it carries for a while it's good bread but they were doing that on the Sabbath day and his disciples uh, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did and what he had need and how we, what, how and was in hunger to he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat the shoe bread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man. There it is. It is, it is man's rest. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it would be like Jesus saying what I just said. Jesus would say, if you can show me in the law where I'm breaking the law, I will gladly. But if Jesus was breaking the law, he couldn't have been Christ. Sin is a transgression of the law. And at no time can we ever ascribe a transgression of any of the laws to Christ. Christ knew what he was doing. He knew that the Pharisees had added all these rules to the Sabbath keeping and all this stuff. He knew that what he was doing was law. What was he doing? Eating. He was eating on the Sabbath day is what he was doing. So anyway, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now turn to Hebrews 4. And I, I may have already covered this, but I just want to touch on it again and get you to understand that there is a rest coming. In fact, if you turn to Hebrews 4, hold your place there and go, um, go to 2 Peter. Let's get some understanding in, in us here. Let's have here a little and there a little. In 2 Peter, um, chapter 2. Uh, by the way, I, I have, I, I was just teasing a while ago, I've, I've, I've had an idea. Actually, it was an idea for a book to put together called The Supernatural Bible. And we live in a country right now. One, one of the things that I tried to convey last Wednesday night to the folks down at Harrison, Arkansas, and they received it well, they really did, was this is a different world that we live in now. Back 50 years ago, if you saw a flying saucer or a UFO, you could not tell a soul. You could not tell anybody for fear of being an outcast, for fear of being made fun of. Things like that. It, even our own military, there were rules, and there unwritten rules in the military. If you were a, if you were an, a uh, if you were a Navy pilot, and you engaged a UFO, you didn't fill out a report. You didn't say a word to nobody about it because you would have got teased and may have even got in trouble, and in some cases, may have ended up missing. But it's a different world now. And 
I think America needs to wake up, especially American churches, need to wake up to the fact that there is a supernatural realm around us. And I can, I can tell you about it by first-hand experience. If you've ever been where you know devils are speaking directly into your soul, telling you to leave, get out, run away, don't you ever come back here, you're in danger. If you've ever been in that situation, you know what I'm talking about. And I want to tell you what, it, it just about drove me to the brink of lunacy. I'm not kidding you. But I've experienced it firsthand. There's some things I've gone through, some things I haven't that others have. But this is a supernatural world around us that we cannot see. As Americans, we sort of we say, yeah, we believe the Bible. But we think that we sort of put that stuff back two or three thousand years ago. Well, that, don't, that happened back then. That doesn't really happen now. I'm disagreeing with you. I think it's going to increase more often. And so I'm going to take that idea of the supernatural Bible. And we're just going to run through some things this weekend of things that are of, of a beyond natural happening. Both in the Bible and in this world. Now, in, in 2 Peter chapter, what I say, chapter 2. Um, let's see. Here. No, yeah. There were false prophets. Is that, no, that, I want chapter 3. This is what I want. I'll get my mind straight in a minute. Um, I've been doing nothing but studying. Last few days, and boy, I was tired. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of, the, of us, the apostles, and the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that there, were, there, shall be, there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Underline that in your Bible. He said, they shall come. What are they, what is motivating them? Their lusts. Okay. In verse 4, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For the, now, watch this. Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. It's one thing to be ignorant of something. And for you to read something for the first time in your Bible and say, boy, I never knew that was there. That, that's one thing. God, God can wink at that ignorance. But to refuse knowledge, to deliberately read something in the Bible and deliberately refuse that knowledge, that's where it's dangerous. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God... The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You understand what that means? He's talking about the flood. It was out of the water, then it was in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That world disappeared. And he's telling you this because he's going to get into something that's going to link to it. That God ended the world and he did it. In an order. What chapter did God end the world in? Genesis what? Seven. And he's telling you something here. It's related to that number. What day, what day is the Sabbath day? The seventh day. Okay? So God's telling you something here. He says, beloved, don't be, don't be willingly ignorant of this knowledge. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, not water, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 
And I could show you commentaries and books that say, now it doesn't really mean that literally. Why not? If it doesn't mean it literally, then why did God literally put it in his literal Bible? The Lord is not slack. What does the word slack mean? Think of a rope or a chain. Take up the slack in that chain or that rope. That rope is good and tight. That chain is good and tight. When they put handcuffs on a guy, they ought to be good and tight. Amen? That's what got that cop in Arnold killed. Was he did not pat down the guy good enough before he put him in a squad car. And he had a gun down in here. And the guy slipped out of his cuffs. And as soon as they got to the police station, pow, popped him. Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That means that if he says 1,000, it means 1,000. If he says a day, it means a day. If he says it's three days, then it's three days. If he says it's seven days, then it's seven days. He's not slack in anything that he says. He means what he says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. With some men, like me, is your homework done? Most of it. To me, that was good enough. I think I'll pass. Don't worry about it. That was me. As some men count slackness. But as long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That blows John Calvin clear out of the sky. Maybe. Because God doesn't want anybody to have to die and be judged and sent to hell. God doesn't want that out of anybody. In fact, let me show you that. Turn to uh, Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel 30. Ezekiel 33. Where Ezekiel 33 is the chapter of the watchman. Um, Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It does not please God to condemn his holy creation. To condemn his creation to an eternity of yelling, screaming, and gnashing of teeth. It does not please God to do that. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? That still sounds to me like man has a choice in his own salvation. Amen, it does. So now back in... Uh, Second Peter, verse 11, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, we've already read in other places that to those of us who are of the day, that day will not come upon us as a thief. So this is why he's telling you, he's telling you these little things. Number one, he's saying, you know, the earth used to be underwater. Now it's above the water. God ended the old world. And now we have a new world. And it's being preserved in store, but God's going to destroy it. And he's saying, now, tie this in with that. Think about this. The day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and as a thousand years is one day. Well, when we read in, in Genesis chapter 2 about the Sabbath day, I believe God was telling you, this is how long it's going to be. And people, people just go nuts when you say, I believe the earth is about 6,000 years old. They cannot handle that because they have had evolution forced down into them so deep and so hard with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever that, that confirms that there's, there's no written evidence. None at all. There's no evidence that the earth is any older than 6,000 years. That when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they were planning, they were, if you watch... 
the, the, the tapes. When um, Neil Armstrong went down the ladder, they had him, they had a tether uh, that hooked to his suit as he's going down the ladder. Because they weren't sure how much dust there was on the moon and how, what would happen if there really was 120 million years worth of dust piled up on the moon, would he and the ship sink down into that dust? And they literally have, you can see him as he goes down the leather, he's got a tether that now when he reaches the bottom and he's testing it out, he sees that it, that's first thing he says is after he says that's one small step for man. He says, I am only go in about a half inch. There wasn't but about an inch or two inches of dust on the moon. And all of the scientists, all of them had said, There's, we expect at least a foot of dust on the moon. That's, uh, that's a millions of years of dust collection on the moon. We're not sure if, the, if they thought that the lunar lander would sink into the dust. And they had a contingency that if they landed and it started sinking, hit a button and then take off. Okay, but the dust was only about that deep and they're going, well, we got that one wrong. <laughs> they always do. So he's saying, verse 10, the day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night and in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Verse 11, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The day of God is that seventh day. And when that day is ended, God is going to dissolve everything, all the heavens, Everything, earth, everything you've done, everything that everybody here on this earth has done, and everything, all of our bodies are going to dissolve. Boom, gone. So he's telling you, like what Christ said, labor not for those things on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, but labor for those things which are in heaven. Okay, now, now, Hebrews 4. So you understand that the week tells you the time frame of God. He's appointed six days for his work in the lives of mankind, all the animals, everything that is established on the earth. He's appointed six days. The seventh day is the millennial rest. It is the reign of Jesus Christ where mankind, there's, he gets to rest from wars. There's not going to be any wars for a thousand years on earth. There's not going to be any wars. Just like in the last presidency, we had no wars. Okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 4. But anyway, that thousand years is a rest for mankind. A rest for politics. A rest for um, wicked banks. Okay. A, a, a rest for just for a lot, man, mankind in general. He gets to rest for a thousand years where Christ and his saints are going to reign. So in Hebrews chapter four, verse one, he said, there, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. When you fear, it's a godly fear. It is the fear of the Lord, one of the seven spirits of God. And he said, don't do with that promise what the Jews did with it. So verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. That blows away your dispensationalism. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They had the gospel. They just didn't believe it. 
And so he said in verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now what he's talking about here in verse 3 is the day when they sent the 12 spies in. Had the 12 spies come back and said, there's giants everywhere, the cities are walled up, but God said that he would give them over into our hand. We believe that we should go do what God said and take that land. God would have given them that land right then and right there. And they would have entered into his rest, but they didn't. Ten of the spies, that represents the law, says you cannot go. You cannot, we cannot do this. And they were willing to go back to Egypt for it. Verse 3. Um, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake, verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day. There it is. Seventh day. And take, write that, write that phrase down. Seventh day. He study that. 52 times in the Bible. So is the phrase third day. Because they're the same day. You measure from Adam to the millennial kingdom. That's seven days. When you measure from Christ first coming to the millennial kingdom, that's three days. So the seventh day from Adam, but the third day from Christ. 52 times in 48 verses, both of them, exactly. Okay? I shared that with my friend uh, from Bible college, and he went, huh. That was interesting to him. So he says, uh, verse 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest... Uh, God did rest the seventh day from all his works... And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day. Remember, all of this is a prophecy. It's typology. It's telling you what's happening in the future. He limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Remember what, the, remember what God said in Genesis 6. My spirit shall not always strive with man. And I believe the spirit will strive with a man in his life until a certain point. God knows when that when he's reached his limit. But then God just refrains. He says, I'm not, I'm not striving with you anymore. I'm done. It's over with. I'm done. What it, like what he did with Saul. Saul continued on being king for years. After he rejected God's word and God rejected him. But God said, I'm done with you, Saul. I'm not going to speak to you ever again. You're not going to hear from me ever again. I'm done. That's it. So, um, verse 8, for if Jesus, and Jesus here is Joshua. Joshua. See, there's 983 occurrences of the name Jesus in the King James Bible. Three of them are not speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, son of God. We have this Jesus who is Joshua. We have Jesus whose surname is Justice. And then we have another Jesus. So that leaves us 980, which is... 70 times 7 times 2. I love that. I love it. But so this is Joshua here. For if Jesus had given them rest. And you can tell by the context. 
For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And Joshua was the one who had pled with the Israelites saying, please, let's, let's do this thing. Those, those giants, they're breakfast for us. God's gonna, they're, we can, we're going to eat them like bread. Let's go into that land. They rent their clothes. And they were going to kill Joshua and Caleb over it. Joshua led all the wars into the promised land, but did he eliminate all the enemies? No. He refused. And he let some of them live, going against what God said. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So there's a rest coming, not only for each saint that dies in Christ, their day of labor is over with. But there is a rest coming to the earth. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. And uh, they're going to beat their politicians into pulp, I guess. <laughs> um, but that day is coming. He's speaking of that particular day as the day of God, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord. And it, yes, it lasts 24 hours, but it also lasts a thousand years. Okay? Now, uh, back in John chapter 5. What time is it? It's already after. It's where we're going next week. Give you a homework assignment. Give me two witnesses or three. Three verses. In the Bible, that proves beyond any doubt that Jesus Christ is God. John 5, 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill it. Now, see, he's already made them very upset. Because he's healed on the Sabbath day. He's rubbing corn in his hands on the Sabbath day and eating. He's doing all this on the Sabbath day. Then he says, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill. Now they really want to kill him. Why? Because he not only had broken the Sabbath. And I had somebody call me and said, uh, Jesus sinned. I said, no, he didn't. And he read this verse. I said, listen here. That's what they accused him of. But you have to take this in the context of what we know from the rest of the scriptures. It is not possible for Jesus to have sinned. If he has, we're doomed. We have no, because the lamb had to be spotless. So anyway, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So your homework assignment for next Wednesday is, give me two verses or three that without a doubt prove that Jesus is God. And whatever you come up with, write them in your Bible. The one that you'll have when you meet the Mormon missionaries or the Jehovah's Witness missionaries at your door. Anyway, any place where you're going to need those verses when they come knocking on your door. And you just whip that out and say, let me read some verses to you. Okay. And I'll never forget that. Reg Kelly went through that with these two guys on their bicycles. He kept trying to, he said, boys, I'll talk to you if you'll answer one question. Is Jesus God Almighty? And the lead guy kept dodging, he kept dodging, kept dodging. The qu Finally, Reg said, I'm only going to ask you one more time. Is Jesus God Almighty? And finally, that guy said, no, he's not. 
Boy, I mean, he was, he was red in the face over that. And uh, Red said, okay, now I'll talk to you. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. I'll talk to you now. But uh, this is important. This is important. Uh, I, I can't remember if somebody sent it to me or it just showed up. It was a YouTube video. And I thought, well, I'll look at it. It was some other preacher. And I, I listened to five minutes of his sermon and I liked him. I don't know who he is. I probably won't listen to him much more. But one, one thing he said was, the internet is pumping out bad theology 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is pumping it out faster than we can fight it off. And he said, we have people falling all over the place because they're being led astray by the internet. Read your Bible, people. Because some of these guys are going to get you to believe that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, that God was not manifest in the flesh. Somehow, some way, they're going to do it, and you're going to fall for it. 